It's nearly one month after Hamas carried out a deadly strike at a music festival being held in a dusty field outside Kibbutz, about five and a half kilometers from the wall that separates Gaza from southern Israel. Now, as Israel's ground offensive intensifies on Gaza, the death toll has crossed 9,000 in this trip. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu and US Secretary of State Antony Blinken met for the third time since the outbreak of the war in Tel Aviv and has of course echoed US President Joe Biden's call to put humanitarian pauses in Gaza's fighting. Israel previously ruled out a ceasefire and had vowed to destroy Hamas and its rule in the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, hundreds are hoping to leave the Gaza Strip that's converged on the Rafah crossing to Egypt on Thursday with those whose names were on an official list. This crossing was open for limited evacuations under a Qatar-brokered deal between Israel, Egypt, Hamas and the United States. The situation in Gaza has turned desperate as the health ministry has said its main power generator has stopped working, putting the lives of hundreds of people at risk. At least 690,000 have been internally displaced and these people are now taking refuge in 149 shelters that have been run by UN Agency for Palestine Refugees. Now, on the 25th day of the conflict, Israeli airstrikes destroyed apartment blocks and even killed dozens of people at a refugee camp in Jabalia in northern Gaza. Jabalia's refugee camp was attacked twice. The mass run Health Ministry has called the attack a heinous massacre. Israeli military says it bombed Jabalia camp to target a key Hamas commander, Ibrahim Bayri. Now, on Sunday, UN adopted a resolution moved by Jordan calling for a humanitarian truce in Gaza and an immediate halt in cessation of hostilities between Israel and Hamas. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday even called the resolution a deeply flawed one and said that no civilized country, including India and others, will tolerate the horrors that have unfolded. India, of course, abstained in the UN General, uh, UN General Assembly vote on this resolution that called for an immediate humanitarian truce. The resolution had 120 votes in favour and 14 against. Before this vote, an amendment to the text proposed by Canada condemning Hamas's terror was rejected because it failed to get the support of two-thirds of members that, are pre that were present there. India voted in favour of this amendment along with 86 other nations. And India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke to Mohammed bin Zayed, who is the President of UAE, on the West Asia situation, the deteriorating security situation and loss of civilian lives. Both these countries have agreed on the need for an early resolution of security and humanitarian situation and a durable regional peace, security and stability in Middle East. But can UAE and India make a difference to the war in Gaza? That's a big question. Anti-Semitic riot at Russia's Dagestan airport earlier this week also saw hundreds hunting for Israeli citizens and Jewish people who had just flown in on a flight from Tel Aviv. Uh, the police made over 80 arrests and President Vladimir Putin of Russia accused the West, even Ukraine, of stirring up this trouble. We need to continue to prevent escalation of this conflict. It spread to other areas and other theaters. The United States has and we will continue to respond to attacks by Iran's proxies to defend our personnel in the region, personnel who are here in Iraq and in Syria to help prevent the resurgence of ISIS. We need to do more to protect Palestinian civilians. We've been clear that as Israel conducts its campaign to defeat Hamas, how it does so matters. It matters because it's the right and lawful thing to do. It matters because failure to do so plays into the hands of Hamas and other terror groups. Now remember, the Rafa border crossing has in fact opened, but it has been a temporary one. The opening of the Rafa border crossing that linked, uh, that is linked to Egypt is the first since the war between Israel and Hamas began on October 7. But what happens in Gaza and what happens to those Israeli hostages that are still under Hamas's control and what is Israel's end game, especially after the destruction of Hamas? International human rights attorney Arsen Ostrowski shares insights from Israel in a CNN News 18 exclusive listening. 
There's no question more burning uh, than whether Israel's attacks on Gaza will endanger these hostages. The state does not have the mandate to sacrifice hostages in this war. I'd like to know your thoughts. Uh, look, it's, it's a very complicated um, op operation right now. There are some 240 hostages uh, being held uh, by the Hamas terror organization in Gaza. This includes at least 30 children. Uh, there are also elderly women. Um, there are Israelis who have been severely injured. Um, and, you know, each one of these hostages, um, that is a war crime. It is a war crime to hold hostages, to hold civilians as hostages as well. And we need to hold uh, Hamas accountable. We also need to remember that it's not only Israelis, but they're also dual nationals uh, from uh, all over the world, including Europe and elsewhere uh, in North America, that are being held hostage uh, by the Hamas. Uh, Israel, like India, like any nation, will do whatever it must uh, militarily um, in order to secure uh, their release and explore all uh, avenues, uh, diplomatic and otherwise, in order to do so. But it will be a, a very difficult and complicated uh, mis mission. Uh, but I can assure you, uh, certainly from our perspective here, that uh, Israel will leave no stone unturned in doing everything possible in order to secure their release and bring them home. Arsene, UN's credibility is being questioned, especially when it has failed to condemn Hamas's actions on October 7. India was one of the countries that abstained from voting at the UNGA because it felt the world should not buy any justification of terror acts. Is the international community at the moment failing to address concerns over terrorism? Um, look, I, I think after what we've witnessed in the last few weeks, and in the last week especially, both at the UN and the comments by the Secretary General, the United Nations has very limited, if any, credibility left. Uh, the UN General Assembly only a few days ago uh, passed a resolution calling for a, a ceasefire, but without, without even mentioning Hamas, let alone calling for the hostages to be released. And only a day or so prior to that, the UN Secretary General, the you know the, the head of this world organization, this body that is meant to promote peace and security, um, and actually said that this massacre did not occur in a vacuum. That is a horrendous thing to say and tantamount to a justification to the heinous, barbaric and savage crimes that we saw. So I'm terribly sorry to say, but the UN right now is not exactly the most credible player in uh, in this region. We all know a violent mob went on a rampage looking for Israelis and Jews chanting anti-Semitic slogans and Allahu Akbar at the Dagestan airport. What does it speak of the failure of Russian law enforcement authorities? And how do you view the conflict now endangering the position of Jews all over the globe? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I think it's not only uh, Russia. What we're seeing is uh, this war being spilled over on the streets, not only in Russia, but we're seeing in Europe, in London, and mm. campuses across America as as well, uh, which we're seeing not uh, something that is not pro-Palestinian protest, but really is pro-Hamas protest. It's really uh, protesters uh, calling for jihad, calling for violence, calling for intifada, calling from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which is a calling cry for the destruction of the state of Israel. They're defending and legitimizing and excusing Hamas uh, war crimes. Um, so we certainly saw that with Russia uh, just a few days ago, which was really uh, ugly, jarring scenes and quite frankly reminiscent of barely a century ago when we had the state-sponsored pogroms there. So I would hope uh, that the Russian authorities uh, take immediate action, as I believe uh, some steps have already been taken in order to identify and charge those who have been responsible. Uh, but I think that falls upon every country, not just in Russia, but Europe and the uh, United States and elsewhere, that do see this kind of violent protest and brazen displays, quite frankly, of support for Hamas uh, to call them out and take immediate action before the situation gets any more worse. Also, what is Israel's end game? Because the question that now arises is what will a post Hamas Gaza be like, especially in terms of governance? Look, you know, there is uh, nothing wrong um, in, in uh, advocating for the Palestinian cause, in advocating for Palestinian people's rights. Um, there is a problem, however, and you have to draw the line when one advocates for the Hamas cause. And the Hamas is very open, very uh, transparent in terms of what their cause is. Their cause is the destruction of the, not only the state of Israel, but the elimination and genocide of the Jewish people. And they are very, very clear about that. Hamas is essentially like a modern-day ISIS, or quite frankly, even the Nazis. Um, you cannot negotiate with them. You cannot have a...
is someone that butchers, burns and decapitates your children, comes into your homes and burns your families and and really executes over 400 or 1,400 people taking at least over 240 hostage. Um, what Hamas is doing amounts to essentially to a double war crime. They're using their own people as uh, civilian, as a human pawns while attacking civilians in Israel. Um, my heart goes out to um, what we are seeing unfold, but quite frankly, the responsibility starts and ends with the Hamas terror organization. All right. Thank you so much, Arsene Ostowski. It was a pleasure to have you here at CNN News 18. Thank you so much for joining in with your precious inputs. Stay safe. At the same time, it's important to highlight that Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah has also broken his silence for the first time ever since the war began. He's called for the victory of Hamas. And soon after, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, has vowed to press ahead in Gaza. He's also ruled out possibilities for a ceasefire. This until Hamas frees all hostages. And of course, he has also warned his puller against any misadventure in northern Gaza, which will have unimaginable consequences. But what does this war do now to the Palestinian cause and what happens to Gazans? And for that, let me also introduce my guest today. I'm joined in by columnist Dalal Irikat, who joins me live from Ramallah. Many thanks to you, Dalal, for joining in. Now, uh, when we talk about Palestine, Israel has hit Gaza's uh, Jabalia refugee camp. That too for a second time in two days. Do you think that the war has now entered an even more terrifying phase with increasingly dreadful humanitarian consequences? Well, what I can tell you is that we are now on day 28 of the continued murders and slaughters and bombings and shellings of the 2.2 million civilians who live in Gaza. The death toll has risen above 9,000 civilians. 4,000 of those, almost 4,000 are children, and 3,000 are women. So basically, Israel is targeting the civilian, the, 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 the besieged civilian population in Gaza under the pretext where they are trying to mislead the world and say that this is a, an Israel versus Hamas war. They are not targeting Hamas uh, leaders. They did not kill any military uh, leaders for Hamas. They're killing the children, the women, the elderly. They're targeting the residential buildings, the mosques, the hospitals, the churches. You know, they're sending warnings to, to hospitals. They're evacuating the people and they're asking them to go to Sinai and to the north. The reality that we need to be dealing with is that Israel is waging a war, a series of war crimes of trying to evict the Palestinian people. Today marks the Balfour Declaration anniversary. And let's remember that uh, paragraph two of the Balfour Declaration basically referred to the Palestinians, uh, non-Jews as minorities who are entitled to rel religious rights alone. This is what Isra the Israeli colonial project is about. They want to transform the Palestinian population who have and enjoy the right to self-determination and who have an embedded right to this land, which was occupied in 1948, where the Israeli state was established into minorities and deprive us from our right to self-determination. All right, Dalal, many thanks to you for sharing in your precious insights. Stay safe.